morning, everybody. My name is Tyler. I'm the pastor here at Wexford Community Presbyterian Church, and we are so delighted to have you here. I'm in front of my Narnia wardrobe, uh, and it's a good day to worship God. So let's worship God together. Thank you for being here. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm, His love endures forever. For the life that's been reborn, His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us, forever, forever. Rising to the setting sun, His love endures forever. And by the grace of God, we will carry on. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise forever, God is. Faithful forever, God is strong. Forever, God is with us. Forever, forever. One of the best parts about being in the community that is the body of Christ is being able to greet one another. Even though we can't do that in person, since we are socially distant at this time, it's still important to recognize that we're still together, that we still do this as a community. And so we have this great technology that enables us to worship in this way right now and enables us to reach out to one another. So let's take a moment, let's pause the video, reach out to someone, send a text, send an email, send a uh, phone call, shout out your window, do all kinds of things to let people know that you care about them and that they are involved in your life. So send something out to someone, say, I thank God for you and I'm glad you're here. So let's greet one another with the love of Christ. Quickly wanted to remind you of some opportunities that we have to get together. One of the biggest things that we have is Coffee with the Pastor that happens every single week. It happens on Tuesdays at 11 a.m. If you would like to be involved in that, there's a link to that in the email that went out, um, in the window that went out this week. If you don't know that, you can email me and let me know. Um, and it's just basically office hours uh, that I'm from 11 to noon. I'm just kind of there on an open Zoom call. And if you want to drop in and talk about anything, that would be great. Here's a topic that I will say that we can talk about this week. If you have any questions about coronavirus, about uh, the pandemic, about our approach to it, um, or just even questions in general, even if you just wanna talk and say, I'm scared or I'm happy or I'm optimistic or I'm all of these things, that'd be a good topic. Now, if you wanna talk about anything else, that's, that's good too, but maybe that's what we need is that sometimes it's good to have a topic to go in. So if you wanna talk about that uh, or anything else, join us at Coffee with the Pastor at Tuesday at 11 a.m. this week and every week. A real quick announcement just to let you know that we are in the midst of fixing something that is taking us a lot longer than it should. Uh, my church email has not been working for a while, and it's not working in the worst possible way in that if you send something to my church email, it doesn't send you a letter back saying this was rejected. It just acts like it got sent. So if you've sent something to tyler at wexfordcpc.org in the last like two months, I haven't gotten it. So just to let you know, if you have anything to send to me in the meantime, you can send it to my, my personal email address. It's just tylerdomsky at gmail.com. Please don't sign it up for a spam or something like that. But let me know, or you can, you can contact me at my mobile number, which is in the, in the directory. But you can contact me directly at my personal email if you need anything. Uh, if I haven't responded to your emails, I'm really sorry. It's because I haven't gotten them, and I'm sorry that you didn't know that I didn't get them. But uh, going forward, that's how it'll be. Uh, until we fix the other thing, which I don't know why we can't fix it, but we will, and when we do, we'll let you know. But for now, you can email me at tylerdomsky at gmail.com. Good morning, guys.
I have a question for you. <clears throat> what is this delicious thing? <laughs> Chocolate syrup, right? Can you tell me some food or dessert or drinks that uh, might go good with chocolate? Mm, maybe some ice cream, right? Chocolate milk. Okay, you put it on some strawberries. You put it on candy. It just makes everything taste that much more sweeter, that much more delicious. All those things you're thinking of, they go really good with chocolate. And you know, one of the things I've noticed with uh, chocolate syrup or just chocolate in general is that when I add it to certain foods, okay, don't, don't tell anyone this, it makes the awesome food or dessert that much more delicious. For example, Okay, somebody offers me some strawberries uh, and I'm already feeling kind of full. I've had my dinner. I'm gonna say no, like I'm good, I'm full. Somebody pours some chocolate on those same strawberries, slides it my way again. <laughs> well then I'm like, well, thank you. I'll, I'll take three of those. <laughs> Remember this peculiar conversation because it, it's gonna come back up in just a minute. In today's scripture, <laughs> we hear that Jesus sees Peter, Andrew, James, and John and they're fishing. Okay, not for chocolate, just regular fish. <laughs> They're fishing because that was their job. That's what they did to help their family. And Jesus comes by and he invites them to stop working and to start following him as his disciples. What a weird request. And the story says that Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they all immediately laid down their nets and they followed Jesus. They didn't even have to think about it. They just did it. In case you might be wondering why they're so quick to follow Jesus, I think this can help us understand why. <laughs> In the same way that chocolate can help someone like me remember how much I love strawberries and fruits, so does Jesus help people like Peter, Andrew, James, and John remember how much they like God. Jesus was really good at helping people see God's awesomeness. The same way how this chocolate syrup helped bring out the awesomeness in all sorts of foods that we already like. Jesus was also really good at teaching his disciples, like Peter, Andrew, James, and John, how to better receive God's awesomeness, how to receive his light, his love, his healing. And as the disciples learned to receive God's awesomeness, then they learned how to share God's awesomeness with others. As we learn from Jesus in these different Bible stories, how we can better receive God's light, love, and healing, we also get to learn how to better share that light, love, and healing. And when we share God's light, love, and healing, just by being ourselves, just by loving on others, sharing with them about God, that's us helping other people see and know God's awesomeness, just like Jesus did. That's us. <laughs> That's us sharing uh, our chocolate syrup with other people, letting them know how wonderful things can be, just like Jesus did with the disciples. That's the good news for today. We can show our friends and family, we can help them see and know God's awesomeness. Just like adding chocolate syrup on some ice cream. Let's pray. Repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for loving us. Please help us to know and receive your love so that we can share your awesomeness with those around us. Just like Jesus did. Pray all this in your name. Amen. See you guys. Have a wonderful day. Another aspect that is so important of our worship each and every week is our opportunity to uh, recognize that we trust God, recognize that God is good and that God is involving and inviting us into what God is doing in and through the church. We uh, do this by offering a portion of, of what we are to the larger ministry of God's doing, to, uh, to respond to the call to, um, to be a part of, of this ministry, that God is... Uh, doesn't need us, but God wants us to be part of this. God is inviting us the same way that a parent would, would do a bring your child to work day. God is bringing us into this ministry of changing the world. 
And that's a great thing. God has gifted us and, and equipped us with opportunities that are different than anybody else. You are unique. There is nothing about you that is like anybody else. And that is on purpose, that God has put all of these desires and abilities and gifts and whatever into you. And we need you. We need your desires and gifts and abilities and, and all of those things uh, as part of this community, as part of this um, all of us that is together. And so whatever you have that brings you joy, bring that to the church and help to share that. If you'd like to give financially to the church, you can do that easily online at wexfordcpc.org slash give. Uh, you could also send things directly to the church. They get deposited every week. But again, think primarily about just the gifts that you have in general, everything that makes up you, the things that you would do when no one was around, the things that you would use to, um, uh, to, to, to make you happy. How can you use those for the church? Even if you don't know, just say, hey, I like doing this. Is there a way that we can do that for the church? Um, that's great. Bring yourself to the offering and let us, with that in mind, present to God our tithes and our offerings. and Happy New Year. Please join me in a word of prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, in Christ you taught us to pray and promised that we would receive all that we ask in his name. Hear now our prayers. For the church universal, for the congregation, its mission and ministry, for the healing of the earth, for peace and justice in the world, for nations and leaders, for our local community, for the poor and oppressed, for the bereaved and lonely, for all who need healing. Guide us, O oh God, by your Holy Spirit, that all of our prayers and all of our lives may serve your will and show your love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Have a great week. This week's scripture reading is from Mark, chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. Hear the word of the Lord. After John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, announcing God's good news, saying, Now is the time. 
Here comes God's kingdom. Change your hearts and lives and trust this good news. As Jesus passed alongside the Galilee Sea, he saw two brothers, Simon and Andrew, throwing fishing nets into the sea, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, he said, and I'll show you how to fish for people. Right away, they left their nets and followed him. After going a little farther, he saw James and John, the deputy's sons, in their boat repairing the fishing nets. At that very moment, he called to them. They followed him, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired workers. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So there is a lot going on in this small little passage. Uh, we are at the first off. We're in Mark again. Uh, this is where we're going to be for the rest of the liturgical year. Uh, it's a great year for Mark. Uh, so I mean, it's always a great year for Mark. But Mark is a great gospel. Uh, it's it's in the top four. Uh, and uh, just as a refresher, I know we've, we've done this the last couple of weeks, but uh, since we weren't Mark last week, um, Mark is the shortest of the Gospels, which makes us to believe that it's the earliest of the Gospels. So we believe that it was written uh, around 70 AD, so within that first generation of, of uh, Christians. And so those, it was written during a time that people who were um, still alive when Jesus was around were still alive. And all of the Gospels, to varying degrees, were kind of written there, but we believe that Mark was the first written. And Mark shares a lot with Luke and uh, Matthew. And so what we think is that Mark was a source. There are some passages that are just straight up copied uh, right out of Mark, uh, and that Mark was a source for Luke and Matthew, and that Luke and Matthew had additional stories that they weren't making up, but that they came from uh, different sources. And so they added their sources to Mark rather than Mark being an abbreviated version of Matthew or Luke, which is why we think that's the first. Uh, nonetheless, though, Mark has its own flavor to it. Each of the Gospels has their own flavor, and Mark has an urgency to it. And we're going to see that today, uh, how it starts. Mark just gets right going. So this is the first chapter. Mark has no Christmas story, uh, has no preamble or introduction or stuff. It's just like, boom, here's Jesus. He's going. And so it starts with the baptism. We had that a couple weeks ago. And then it gets right into this. Right after the baptism of Jesus, uh, we have John the Baptist getting arrested. And then Jesus is just saying, you know what? Let's do it. Now is the time. So uh, this is where, and because of the urgency, we get this big theme that comes out of Mark of repentance. Um, it's a big theme in all the Gospels, but particularly in Mark. And the urgency often gets translated by people as um, a danger. And so the urgency is, you better watch out. You better not cry. You better not pout. I'm telling you why. God is going to come here and smite you. So you better change. And that's not how it's supposed to go. So this idea of repentance, um, again, kind of that sense of repent for the end is near, it's, it's kind of the action hero, uh, action movie sense of like, Jesus is coming. And like Arnold Schwarzenegger is like, get through the chopper, like that we need to get out of here because terrible stuff is coming. And that is not the case at all. Uh, it is definitely, if if we think of the, the coming well, a good way to put it is this, and I think this is this is a good kind of theme to like write on a piece of paper and hang it on your um, hang it on your refrigerator or somewhere where you're going to see it all the time. If uh, if God's presence is a threat, then that is not good news. Uh, and so the whole idea of repent for God is coming, like you better fix yourself because God's going to get here and see all the terrible things you did. That's like the cat in the hat. So. If you know the, the story of the cat in the hat, at the end of the cat in the hat, the, these kids are, uh, it's a rainy day, um, the cat in the hat shows up, causes all these problems, and be, and is really kind of a jerk. Uh, and uh, But then at the end, oh no, mom is getting back, We what are we going to do? we got to get this thing figured out before mom gets here, or we're going to be in trouble. So the, the impending presence of mom means we better fix everything before mom gets here, or we're just going to get slammed. That's kind of the attitude that we often give to God. And I do want you to sit and think about that for a second. What is good about that? And yet that's our prevailing image of God. That is not the prevailing image of God in the Bible. Now, there's a lot of passages that would suggest that if you were to pick them out specifically. But the larger narrative of God, and which is this is kind of God's uh, desire to have us change our way of thinking is is the repentance that it's talking about is stop thinking of God as this parent who's going to come here and yell at everybody because it's such a mess. And instead, the good news that's good 
is that we don't have to worry anymore because God is here. That God's arrival should be an exciting thing, not this panic of, oh no, we need to get the house clean because company is coming. So that change needs to happen. The other thing that's, that's real key is that sometimes, uh, so I'm going to get into the Greek here. Uh, just as a reminder, the Old Testament is all written in Hebrew originally, uh, ancient Hebrew. Uh, and the New Testament is all written in ancient Greek, this Koine Greek, Koine with a K-O-I-N-E, if you wanted to be fancy sounding like I just was. Uh, Koine Greek is the Greek that is used in scripture. And so um, it's important sometimes, sometimes it can sound kind of pretentious when we say like, well, in the original Greek, but, and it can also sound um, gatekeeping. It can sound like it's a secret, uh, that there's a mystery that only special people who can understand Greek and Hebrew uh, can get. And, and it's important that we don't do that, but it's also important to recognize that it, it's helpful to know what the original translations are, not so that we can keep people out, because that's what the whole Reformation was about, was that the priests were the only ones who could read the Bible, and, when, and you need re regular people to be able to read the Bible. If it's good news for everybody, it's good news for everybody. That being said, though, there are nuances in the Greek that we miss. And one of the nuances that's really important in this, and it really kind of changes, I think it can change fundamentally the whole way we see repentance and belief and everything like that. So it says within the text, uh, repent, change your, change your mind, change your, uh, your thoughts and your minds, and trust this good news. So in that, we have the word repentance and the word belief, the word trust, which, which is um, for belief. And so both of those words, the word repentance in Greek is metanoia, uh, the word belief or trust in Greek is pistis. Uh, and so both of those words are really key words to know. And, and they're both verbs. They're both things that you can do. I, 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 this, each of my emails end with this, that faith is a verb, do something. Um, we treat faith like it's something you can have. It's not a noun. You can't have it, you do it. And so this is a good example of that, where trust comes into trust, this good news. Um, but both of those in this passage and kind of throughout the Gospels are plural imperatives. And so I want to stress the importance of that. And before we get into the weeds of this, what I'm saying is that what Jesus is saying is all of y'all need to change. And all y'all need to trust. We don't have in the English language a great um, plural verb or plural you. Uh, which most languages do. The best we do is we have y'all, which is which we don't say in the north or really anywhere outside of the south. But that's what it's saying is that all y'all need to change. The reason why that's so important is that we have turned faith over time, especially in Western Christianity, we've turned faith into an individual thing, a close personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's become the paramount idea of how we engage with God. But that is not what Jesus is saying is first and foremost. Jesus is saying first and foremost, all of us need to change because the old system was about the individual changing. Yes, there was corporate belief and corporate things, but all of the Levitical law was about what you as an individual do, primarily. The, the bulk of those laws were about, you need to not eat this, you need to not do that, you need to not wear this, and you need to not have that behavior. But that moral personal obligation became the bedrock of the religion, and Jesus is coming in and saying, whoa, 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 no, no, no. You guys missed the point of all those laws. So we're going to accomplish those. We're going to fulfill those. Boom. Now you don't have to worry about it. Now we can worry about all y'all changing your hearts and your minds. So an interesting thing in that. So it says change your hearts um, and, your, and your minds. And, and uh, that's a nuance of the Greek. And, and our, our translation that we heard today, the Common English Bible, gets that. Uh, uh, different translations will say, repent, change your uh, turnaround, uh, which comes from shuv, which is the Hebrew uh, word that kind of plays into repentance and to what we understand that to be. Um, and uh, this, so the, the, the whole idea of repenting, the whole idea of changing, is an important one for us to, um, oh, sorry. The, the Greek gets into, uh, in Greek culture, which is, again, kind of the prevailing culture of biblical times, uh, we often think, well, I feel, we feel here. We feel in our heart. We love in our hearts. Where, where, if you think about that, really, like not, no, no 
no love comes from your heart. Blood comes from your heart. Oxygen comes from your heart. Like life comes from your heart. But feeling doesn't come from here. Feeling still comes from here. We associate feeling with here and, and then your gut feeling. We still kind of locate different emotional responses down in our body and then thought, higher level thinking up here. The Greeks put thought here, which seems weird to us, but we put love here, which is also weird. Love is still here. Love and gut feeling and everything is up here. This is all kind of machinery. <laughs> uh, that sense, though, is an important sense of like, why it says change your hearts and minds is that when they're saying change your hearts, they're still change, saying change your thoughts, change your way of thinking. So that idea of repentance really shapes the entire gospel. All of the good news is that this isn't just about individual change. This isn't just about you making yourself right with God. This is about all of us changing. And the whole idea, again, that it's God's coming is not a threat. It's, hooray, God is here. Now we don't have to worry about stuff. Now we don't have to fear what we used to fear. That God coming is like that great uncle that you loved that would always bring like candy out of his pockets. And then it was super exciting when they would show up. It's that it's think of whoever it is in your life. If I told you that person was coming today that you wouldn't think, oh no, I have to do all this stuff. You'd think, oh, hooray, this is it. Maybe you don't have that person in your life anymore, but I'm sh I hope you do. You definitely did at some point that there was some relative, whether it was your grandma or your grandpa or your uncle or your uh, best friend or something like that, that the presence of them coming would just only produce pure joy in you. That you wouldn't feel like you now have to do all of these things to fix everything up and get it ready. It's just, hooray, this person is coming. That's how it should be when Jesus says, God is near, the kingdom of heaven is near, and now is the time. There is, and, and the whole message is that we do this together that we together as a community must change. Yes, individuals change, but the most important thing is that it's not just, it doesn't end with individual change. It is we can do this, we can change, we can stop operating as though we should be afraid of God. And we could start operating as though God is good and that God's presence with us is good and help other people to see that as well. So the, this phrase, now is the time, really strikes, harkens in me, and maybe in you, uh, a reminiscent of a very specific part of Disney World. I'm sure that's where you thought I was going. So I do want to put out on the table, I get a reputation of loving Star Wars. I do love Star Wars. But Star Wars is not, Star Wars is kind of within the top ten of things that I love culturally. It's not number one. Number one may be Disney World. I love Walt Disney World. I, I'm just... I, I have this weird, I want to know everything about it and how it was made and all these different things. And so uh, if, on a pretty regular basis, I have a Walt Disney World filter just kind of going through my head. I read books on Walt Disney World, I read facts and trivia, all kinds of weird stuff. And so when this phrase came up, now is the time, it really triggered my Walt Disney World thing. So there's a thing in Walt Disney World called the Carousel of Progress. The Carousel of Progress was made in 1964 for the World's Fair. So the World's Fair happened in New York. It's where the big globe is. It's in Flushing, New York. It's a weird place to have a World's Fair. This is back when World's Fair actually mattered. But every year or so, or a couple of years, I don't know what the thing, I think it was every year, but at least every couple of years, there, there was a World Exposition World Fair. And these went, they were a big deal until the mid, uh, kind of the 60s into the, like they really peaked at the 1964 World's Fair. So, but it was a time where technology and, and fraternity uh, or egalitarian uh, brotherhood. These are all masculine forms, but that's the way they talked back then. Um, the whole idea that we could do this together as a world was on display in those World's Fairs. It was the best of us. And so the 1964 World's Fair, uh, the U.S. had the World's Fair again, and they kind of turned everything over to Disney. And this is where so much of Disneyland and Disney World really uh, Disney World hadn't been around yet. It came in 1971. Uh, but Disney World, Disneyland had been around for, for uh, the better part of a decade at this point. And so, so much of the technology, what Disney was doing, was brought into the World's Fair. This is where you get It's a Small World first premiered there and the Carousel of Progress. Now, the Carousel of Progress currently is, uh, it's not fun. <laughs> it's kind of boring. I love it. It's, it's, I mean, it's fun in the sense, but it's, so it, it, you sit in this room and you watch, you, you sit 
basically on this turntable. So you're sitting on the outside of a turntable and it slowly rotates and, and you see a room here and a room here and a room here and a room here. And it, it tells you the story of how we as an American civilization have technologically advanced from the, like the 1890s through today as of 1989. Um, and shows how technology has moved throughout that. When it first started, there's a long intro for, the, for this, but when it first started, there was a song that was written that went along with it. And this song is, is somewhat familiar, and, and it's written by the Sherman Brothers, who wrote all the music for uh, Mary Poppins, and a lot of Disney music is written by the Sherman Brothers. And the song was called, There's a Great Big Beautiful Tomorrow. And it went like this. There's a great big beautiful tomorrow, shining at the end of every day. There's a great big beautiful tomorrow, for tomorrow is just a dream away. Man has a dream, and that's the start. He follows his dream with mind and heart. And when it becomes a reality, there's a dream come true for you and me. So there's a great big beautiful tomorrow, shining at the end of every day. There's a great big beautiful tomorrow, just a dream away. So that song would just play on a loop throughout this whole thing. And the, and the whole ride is like 20 minutes long. So you're, you constantly hear people singing this song. And so um, that song was great, still is great. And it's still part of the ride when the ride operates. And you kind of see it throughout Disney World and peppered throughout things. But at a certain point when the ride had been operating for a while, a new company took over as a sponsor. They would get corporate sponsors to help pay for the rides and stuff like that. And it was General Electric. And so General Electric decided, hey, that's a great song, but that song is all about how things will be good later in the future. What about a song about how things are good right now? Like that we're not just changing for the future, we're changing things for today. And so Disney called up the Sherman Brothers and said, hey, we need you to write a song to replace that other song, it's great. And they wrote this song that was the theme, became the theme for uh, the Carousel of Progress, and it's called Now is the Time. And it goes like this. Now is the time. Now is the best time. Now is the best time of your life. Life is a prize. Live every minute. Open your eyes and watch how you win it. Yesterday's memories may sparkle and gleam. Tomorrow is still but a dream. Right here and now, you've got it made. The world's forward marching and you're in the parade. Now is the time, now is the best time, be it a time of joy or strife. We're so glad to cheer for, be glad you're here for, it's the best time of your life. And that's how it went. Also by the Sherman Brothers, they basically write the same, it's pretty much the same song. They also write, uh, it's a small world, it's a world of laughter, a world of, and uh, uh, imagination, one little spark of inspiration. I, there's a lot of Disney songs, and they're all written, they're all basically the same song by the Sherman Brothers. But anyway, so that became the new song. And that song is all about how now we can change it. Now eventually, there was a refurb, and they just went back to There's a Great Big Beautiful Tomorrow, which is great, and it's all about how tomorrow's gonna be good. But the whole reason why I sang those songs, the whole reason why I brought those songs up is that that is a good example of kind of where we are with Christianity. We are, there's a great big beautiful tomorrow. The good news that we usually have, that we usually tell ourselves in the world is, one day, things will be better. So, it's just a dream away. Like, get ready for, eventually, things are going to be okay. Which is good news. But it's not good news for today. It's good news for tomorrow. The other thing that GE said, you got to change it so that things are actually a little better today, is really the story of today's passage. Now is the time. Literally, that's what Jesus says. Hey, now is the time. Change uh, your hearts and minds and trust this good news. Trust this truth that God is coming and that is good now, not tomorrow, not get ready, but now. That idea of now being the time is the sense of urgency that Jesus wants for us. Not urgency of like, you better watch out. Let's, we gotta clean this up before mom gets home. I hope the cat comes back with some kind of outrageous contraption to undo everything he did. That's spoiling the plot of the cat in the hat. Uh, but that 
is really the attitude that we often have in the church. And even if that's not the overt attitude we have, it's kind of the one that people think we have. And so we allow that to be the way in which we communicate good news. But really good news is saying, no, no, no. God is here now. When we say God is good all the time, all the time, God is good. When we say that, we mean right now, not God will be good tomorrow and all tomorrows God is good. We're saying right now God is good. So we shouldn't be afraid by God. We should be delighted by God. And the message that Jesus has for us is that we can change right now. And we can change together as a community, as a culture, as a collective. We can be better. We don't need to wait until those things. We are really good at stacking up piles of things to change. I am exceptionally good at it. If you were to look around my house, you would see piles of things everywhere. And those piles, some of them are neat and some of them are not. Uh, most of my bookshelf is a collection of books of which one day I will read. I've read more than half of them, which makes me feel pretty good, but I certainly have not read them all because they're eventual. They're tomorrow. There's a great big beautiful tomorrow when I will have read all of the Stephen King books. I'm just looking at my bookshelf right now. That, that was a weird one to choose, but yes, I, there's a number of those books that I haven't read. That's kind of how we operate in our lives, is that we collect things that one day we will do. And we, in our aspirations of one day, I will be better that I can do this. One day, when I'm not so tired, I can do this. One day, when the pandemic's over, then we can do this. And that's not what Jesus is calling us to do. Jesus is saying, this is, there's not just a great, big, beautiful tomorrow. Now is the time. Now is the best time of your life because God is here today. That this is the day that the Lord has made. We need to rejoice and be glad in today. That is good news. As we go forward, as we uh, try to respond to this good news, let us have faith that now can, is, is better. That now is the time that we can do something. Uh, we as we went through an inauguration this week, we also have a tendency to put all of our hopes into other people, into a Messiah, a savior, a rescuer from a culture that we, one way or another, regardless of who you voted for, that we have great examples of two different presidents that both sides have said, well, this is the guy who's going to fix everything. No, this is the guy who's going to fix everything. He's going to put everything back to right. And sure, well, no, they're not going to fix everything, but we should elect leaders that are going to help us, but we shouldn't put all of our faith in leaders. We shouldn't put all of our, all of our doubts in leaders. We should know that, it's, that we can change, that we are the ones who need to change our hearts and minds, that we are the ones who need to trust that this is good news. And we need to respond like that. And then we need to help other people see that too, that that is the difference that Jesus is asking for right now, that now is the time that all y'all need to trust. All y'all need to change. We collectively can become something better right now. Now, we don't need to fix it all today, but we can start today. That the way in which we travel from place to place is piece by piece. That we don't need to run a marathon all in one day, but if we do a little bit each day, that eventually we're gonna get where we need to be. Instead of just saying, one day we'll be there. Today, we can start. So that's the encouragement that we have for you. The encouragement that Jesus has for us is that, is that we need to change our hearts and minds. We need to trust that this is good news, that God's presence with us is actually good. We need to know that God's kingdom is coming. And we need to know that now is the time. Now is the best time. Now is the best time of your life. Life is a prize. Live every minute, open your eyes, and watch how you win it. Yesterday's memories may sparkle and gleam, tomorrow is still but a dream. Right here and now, you've got it made. The world's forward marching, and you're in the parade. Now is the time, now is the best time. Now is the best time of your life. There's so much to cheer for. Be glad you're here, for it's the best time of your life.
the life I believe you are the way the truth the life I believe through every battle through every heartbreak through every circumstance That you are my fortress, you are my portion, you are my hiding place. I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. I believe you are the You are provider, you are protector, you are the one I love. I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. I believe you are the way, the truth. It's a new horizon and I'm set on you and you meet me here today with mercies that are new all my fears and doubts they can all come to because they can't stay long when I'm here with you it's a new horizon and I'm set on you and you meet me here today with mercies that are new All my fears and doubts They can all come to Because they can't stay long When I believe you are The way The truth The life I believe you are the way, the truth, the life, I believe you are. So now it's time for us to go. It's time for us to leave this sacred space, this holy space in which we've been together for this time, and to go out into the world, to re-engage with the world around us. We go, not into the world, we go into the world not bringing God to the world, but go following God in a world in which God is alive and active, bearing witness to God in all that we say and do. Helping others to see the good news that God is here. To not be afraid of God, but to rejoice and take relief in the fact that God is with us and that God is doing something new. That now is the time and that we can change our hearts and minds collectively to be something better to be a, a more inclusive, a more loving, a more caring people, not just as uh, a family or as a community or as a nation, but as an entire world, as an entire people, that we can begin this process of becoming the kingdom of God. So let's do that and let's go and let's let people know that this is good news. Let's demonstrate that in what we say and do that when people see us, they say, look at those people having fun. That sounds like something rather than, look at those people really upset and scared. That's not good news. Let's live out that good news in, in, in our actions and in front of people and with people and for people. And when we see that, they will see God. So let's go and do that. And as you do, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever.
Have a fantastic week. Stay warm, stay safe, and we will see you next week. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Mike Godfrey and I'm chair of the Christian Education Committee at Wexford Community Presbyterian Church. And a while back, Pastor Domsky asked some of the elders and deacons if they could maybe um, put something together that would um, allow the congregation to get to know their leadership a little better. And so, um, although I think a lot of you know me already, you may not know that I uh, have a hobby of gnome doors. And um, some of you may know that because uh, from time to time when we would have the Malawians visit us, if I was chairing a committee, I would usually invite the uh, Malawians plus members of my committee to my house and we would uh, kill the fatted calf and have a very nice meal. Um, sometimes we invited some music uh, to come and perform for us, and then uh, I would always throw out the added incentive that there would be tours of Gnome World. And this year, because of the pandemic, um, I had extra time on my hands, and I really put a lot of effort into Gnome World, uh, knowing that Disney was down because of the pandemic. I thought I might be able to compete better for the enchantment dollar. And so I put some effort into it, got some new gnomes, built some new doors. And what you're about to see is a guided tour of Gnome World, a sort of a virtual fellowship event. So I hope you enjoy and um, welcome to Gnome World. Oh, and one more thing. I make a reference when I'm giving the tour in Gnome World to Holy Ground. Um, but I, I don't really follow through with that because I want to make sure I'm not being blasphemous. However, what part of Scripture am I referring to uh, when I mention Holy Ground? Hopefully you know the answer to that. But if you don't, I would encourage you to seek out a CE class so that we can learn more about the Bible together. And uh, then you can have these references uh, in your head and uh, able to share them with friends and family. Thank you. Welcome to Gnome World. And um, before I forget to mention it, it shouldn't be confused with Gnome Land, which is in California and is much smaller. But the welcome sign, the official welcome sign to Gnome World comes from my parents' garage. My mother passed away on June 1st of this year and I was cleaning out some of their things and I thought what a perfect sign to have for Gnome World. Um, we get 50% of our DNA from each parent. I think the idea and the um, building of Gnome World is clearly from her half of the DNA. I think my dad would agree to that as well. We'll start off with the very first Gnome to Gnome World. It's a store-bought Gnome door with what I call a BW gnome uh, at Baldwin Wallace University where my son Max went to school there's a little gift shop on Front Street in Berea, Ohio that sells these gnomes and because the campus of BW has a lot of really great gnome doors or gnome trees I should say um, I would buy these gnomes and, and paint a little BW on the yellow half and um, stick them by one of the, the gnome doors, or gnome trees, and, um, and then the kids would steal them and then I'd put them back. And I did this for several times. And then finally I made a gnome door for, for them and it made the cleveland.com website and uh, where they confused a little bit with uh, the Keebler elves. Uh, elves and gnomes are not the same thing, um, but I can understand for a novice them making that mistake. Um, but this door does work, in fact work, and uh, you can open it and uh, the gnome can have access to the <coughs> gnome tree. So let's start on our path. Uh, you can see the path here in the gnome world. Whenever you come to a larger 
a stone, you know you've got an intersection. And the first intersection takes you by Gottfried, the giant gnome. And this is a great gift from my children on Father's Day this year. And he is kind of the king of Gnome World. And because he is the king of Gnome World, uh, he has his own larger gnome door. Uh, his name is Gottfried. Gottfried um, is, if you go on the internet and buy him, that is what you would buy, Gottfried the giant gnome. But that happens to be the Germanic spelling of my name, Godfrey. Um, Gottfried, or Godfoy is a Teutonic name that means God's peace. And then when it went to Germany, it became Gottfried. And when it went to England, it became Gottfried, which is our name. Uh, the Gottfried door, I built some steps so that the door doesn't uh, have to lean back so far. It gets it higher up the tree. And I bought a fleur de lis with Gottfried's sig symbol on it across. Gnomes are surprisingly religious. And then some um, memorabilia that says, Blessed are the curious, for they shall have adventures. And then a little Irish thing here as well, and a little decorative. Uh, flower. Um, the Godfrey's uh, fence here is a, um, a, a shield from the Holy Roman Empire. Um, the Teutonic Order of Knights uh, came from the Holy Roman Empire and um, so I made Godfrey a, uh, a knight of the Holy Roman Empire and again a Celtic cross with a crown over it and then G for Gottfried. So that's Gottfried's home. Uh, I will say um, we have this is a gnome door that I built. Again you see the cross on top which denotes the religious devotion of these gnomes. The gnome that lives here right, is riding a squirrel and um, that's not always normal but it does it does happen. Okay, so we'll follow the path and uh, I have a Canadian themed gnome door down here uh, red and white with the Canada and US flag there as symbol symbolizing cooperation. And then on the back of Gottfried's door I have a, a Canadian theme uh, here as well. Uh, this license plate represents um, the uh, 10 provinces and the three territories uh, that are in Canada. I have been to nine of the 10 um, provinces and none of the uh, territories. I wanted this year to take a trip to, um, to Canada to uh, get the missing province, which is Manitoba and all three of the territories, but the Canadian government would have none of it. Now, that was a joke. It's not a funny joke, and I'll tell you why. Uh, first of all, it's a pun, and puns usually aren't funny. And then second of all, it's, it's a pun that if you're an American, you probably don't know that the last territory in Canada is the territory of none of it, which was created in 1999 out of the Northwest Territory listed here and um, and then if you're a Canadian um, you're probably saying hey it's not funny because uh, it was funny the two millionth time that joke was made back in 2000 uh, but it's not funny anymore they would they would say that the year 2000 called and they want their joke back the uh, other maple leaves here that I have on the sign, they are indicative of the Canadian postal codes, which I've always liked and which are symmetrical, which go letter, number, letter, number, letter, number. And um, so that's indicative of, of that. Um, the, I would recommend uh, Prince Edward Island uh, as a place to visit. It's a very wonderful place. Um, it is the uh, it is the home of 
Anne of Green Gables um, and is um, the birthplace of Confederation. Um, there, the uh, provinces of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick were going to confederate and the province of Canada, not the country of Canada, but the province of Canada, which consisted of Upper Canada and Lower Canada, um, got w wind of this. And so in September of 1864, they met in, uh, in Charlottetown on Prince Edward Island to talk about becoming a confederation. And um, on July the 1st, 1867, under the British North American Act, Queen Victoria declared that uh, Canada was a dominion. Uh, Upper Canada became Ontario and Lower Canada became Quebec. And uh, those were the four provinces of Canada that started out. Upper Canada just means they were at the headwaters of the St. Lawrence River and then Quebec was in the, the um, downstream so that's where upper and lower canada becomes so this is another known door um, that i built i developed this style i had some trouble with my gnome doors where they fall apart and rot so i had to use better wood and i painted them better and um, and so this is one of my larger gnome doors and i have a gnome here that's holding a lantern and that lantern does light up at night and um, we have some flowers that we decorate and um, we'll go back onto the floor. I've tried to introduce some, some decorative um, greenery. And we have a turtle here, which I don't know why it, I have it, but I do. And then this uh, path leads to my Scandinavian gnome door, my Swedish gnome door. Um, Janet bought me a, a gnome that of a Scandinavian girl and because in honor of uh, Ingrid um, who has Janet and her side of the family have Swedish roots um, I decided to make a, a Swedish door and we have the Swedish American flag here and in Swedish collars and um, this is probably my best gnome door when I talk about gnome holes um, and that's a really good one but I put the door over here just because uh, because of the way I wanted my paths to go. Uh, so we'll go back down and get back on the path, the main path. Again, we have uh, another path up here to the first known door that I, that I had made uh, by my uncle. Uh, my mom had asked my uncle to make me a known door and he made it out of wood that kind of rotted away and so I've saved all his hardware and I, I keep um, I've, I've made this gnome door and we got a gnome here coming out of the tree um, out of the window this is a is a goose these were popular a few years ago where you're supposed to decorate them for the seasons um, I never did uh, never did like that I like gnomes but I don't like geese so much but I keep it in gnome world the, we have beautiful flowers here, but the deers have eaten the deer have eaten them all, and um, so that's very disturbing. If we follow down the path here, you'll see an alternate entrance to Gnome World, and I had plans to build a um, a bridge to Gnome World off the deck, but Janet has uh, vetoed that idea. Um, she's been surprisingly tolerant of Gnome World, so I don't really push the issue, and I have not mentioned. Um, my ideas of a monorail system into no more either. If we continue on, I was going to make, take off my shoes here as we are entering holy ground, but that would be blasphemous. And um, I, I don't blaspheme, I don't blaspheme in here. And I'll give you extra credit for anybody who can tell me what movie that's from and who said it. But we are entering the high rent district of no more where the West Virginia gnomes are. We have uh, two knit West Virginia gnomes here and uh, I took another thing from my parents house um, which uh, shows the West Virginia border and the state of West Virginia so this is just clearly the high point of gnome world and then lastly uh, we have miniature gnome world and uh, a door store by door and those supposedly those lights 
um, will light up those windows will light up at night but they don't do that good of a job and then you have the exit to no more door but I do want to add one other thing real quick before I go is a couple of weeks ago we actually had and this is true a real black bear that walked through no world on his way to the bird feeder and um, he, he was in the neighborhood and what's interesting about that is the black bear is the state animal of West Virginia and with that I hope you've enjoyed your tour um, and you're more than welcome to visit in a person once the COVID-19 restrictions are lifted. Hi, if you're still here, you want to see what's in my Narnia drawer? My wardrobe? It's probably not what you think.